Hey there, welcome to another episode of Carve Your Own Fucking Path, a podcast made to inspire you to create a life in business on your own terms. You'll hear candid interviews with people who have boldly decided to blaze their own trail, and the occasional solo show with me, your host. I'm Willa McDonough, on-camera coach, storyteller, and remote video producer. Five years ago, I moved from my home base of San Francisco to the coast of Portugal, taking a big leap into the unknown. Some called it courageous, I called it carving my own fucking path. Today I live in Lisbon and run a business that elevates your online presence, helping you show up confidently on camera to create videos that showcase your brand and personality so you can get more visibility and attract clients by being yourself. If you're just starting out in business or you've been doing it for a while, you're sure to pick up tidbits of actionable advice and hopefully feel inspired by stories from people who have chosen the unconventional and sometimes messy path. And if you've been waiting for a sign to start carving your own fucking path, this is it. I'm so happy you're here. Ooh, do I have a treat for you. Okay. This is a juicy episode. And I say that because, well, if you read the title, it had sex written twice. So Irene Fair is a sex and intimacy coach. She is the sex pert. She is regularly published in the Huffington Post and Refinery29 and Elite Daily. So she is a wealth of knowledge and very well known in the field. She graciously shared her story, the intimate details of her experience in a, in a sexless marriage that started out with painful sex. And then she was in her late 20s. So really young and just trying to like navigate this unknown world of the female libido. And she went to traditional therapy and then ended up uh, being introduced to coaching and then specifically a sex and intimacy coach. And in in that experience, her, her life completely changed and she chose to devote her life to helping other people, other women and couples. Irene is a complete joy to talk to. And she was so open and so, you know, real and raw about her own story and her own journey. And her mission is so fucking powerful. <laughs> and her it's funny, her mission statement is a well-fucked woman will change the world. Let's dive in to this interview. And I'm really excited for you to meet Irene. Welcome to the show, Irene Fair. Thank you so much for joining Carve Your Own Fucking Path. So you are a sex and intimacy coach for couples and women. Yes, that's right. And I have a million questions and I can't wait to dive into your path and you know what brought you to where you are today. So let's dive right in. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> so take us back to well. Take us back before, (laughs) this is a very general question, but, um, you know, what did you envision for your life? So maybe in your teens or your twenties, like what, did you have a a path that you thought you, you would take? That's a great, great question. And there was a path, uh, and it wasn't really determined by me. It was really determined by my circumstances. So I, came to the United States as an immigrant when I was 10 years old. And that really shaped everything for me, especially in my early adulthood, because as an immigrant and as a daughter of immigrant parents, I wanted to succeed. I wanted to make something of myself in this new country in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And the focus of my career path, my education path was all on making it big, getting a good job, a stable mm-hmm. job, making my, um, my livelihood sustainable, meaning like I would have a job that would support me. And that was what my parents wanted for me. And that's what I wanted for myself too. Again, being an immigrant in a new country, it's, it's natural to want to do that. Mm-hmm. So that led me to study economics in college and want to be in business, which okay. was the path. But there was also kind of a parallel path in all of this, which was an interest in humans and human beings and life mm-hmm. and, and uh, especially um, teaching other people. So I remember coming home from school, 11 years old, we had just arrived in the U.S. 
and I didn't speak much English, but I would come home from school. I would sit all of my toys down and teach them everything I learned in gibberish. That's so cute. Because I didn't know English enough and I, I was still I mean, learning some words, but basically I was trying to teach them everything that I learned, like math and all that in gibberish. What, was, native, what was your native language? Where did you move from? I moved to the U.S. from a country that no longer exists called the Soviet Union. Oh, okay. Um, so I was in what's now Ukraine, mm-hmm. but my primary language is Russian. Okay. Wow. So, <laughs> so it's a completely different world and the pressure you were saying, you know, to get a good job and, you know, sustain yourself. Was that because that's the American dream? Like, is that, you know, your parents were moving to the U.S. for this new life, new beginning, and you better not take advantage of it. That kind of exactly. thing. Absolutely. Okay. And uh, career paths in the Soviet Union at the time were very limited. Mm-hmm. Uh, because of so many hoops and things that you had to uh, jump through to get to not only get to the universities that you wanted to go to, but also get the jobs that you wanted. Mm -hmm. And so everything was very limited there. And yes, when we came to the U S it was like, okay, well now it's not that you could choose anything, but choose the best thing and yes, create that American dream. Yeah. And absolutely, I, I thought that was a wonderful thing to do as well. And again, business made more sense. Mm-hmm. There was this other part of me that was interest that intrinsically was interested in a whole different set of of interests and and things that I wanted to do and skills. Like I have mm-hmm. always been a teacher, but being a teacher was looked down upon. Like, why would you want to be a teacher? Like, you would get what, twenty five, thirty thousand dollars a year. That's mm-hmm. not very sustainable. So yeah, in that I th- that really shaped where I went through mm-hmm. in the first part of my life. Okay. So business. And did you get a business degree then? I studied economics as, uh, um, in my undergrad, and then I ended up working in uh, on Wall Street in New York in marketing specifically. Okay. And then when I moved to California, I was in Silicon Valley also doing corporate marketing, mm-hmm. so business slash marketing. And your your people interest was that still in the back of your mind? Was it something that you were pursuing, or what? How what did that look like for you? It was definitely in the back of my mind, and. It, showed up very strongly actually on 9-11 and I was working across the World Trade Center at the time, 130 Liberty Street, which was the building just south of of the towers. And 9-11 woke up this realization in me that I want to work with people, that people matter, Mm -hmm. but I didn't know what that might look like. I did ponder enrolling in the army during that time. But where the country went politically discouraged me from doing that. Mm -hmm. I I did not support that at the time. And so, so yes, it woke something up in me, but I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know what working with people might look like. Mm -hmm. Several years later, it started to form into, well, I'm going to work in nonprofits, in the nonprofit world in Africa or Latin America, South America. But that too was just kind of still like, I'm not sure if this is what I want to do, but it, the, the seeds were planted mm-hmm. for sure. 9-11. And I kept okay. thinking about it for the next following 10 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. So 10 years, always like a little bit of an back, the back burner. Yeah. In a way. Okay. Did you have any encouragement? Like were your parents encouraging you in any way, or did you even speak to them about it? Did you have any mentors or anything like that? I did not. I did not have any mentors. Uh, most of my friends at that time were in the corporate world and we were mm-hmm. all in, in the same boat. And in a way, the corporate world was, if, I'm sure you've heard the saying, uh, the golden handcuffs. Yeah. Right. Um, it's so compelling to stay because mm-hmm. lifestyle and benefits are so good. And it, it's like a prison. <laughs> You felt like you were in a prison. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was using at most 5% of what I'm capable of. Mm -hmm. 
like in terms of my skills and in terms of my 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 whole being like for example i wasn't using my heart at work yeah. i wasn't using my um like my like relationships with people that wasn't mm-hmm. you know it, it, if you talked about relationships at work just even relationships between people like it was all about playing games and manipulation. Whereas for me, one of my biggest values is creating relationships best, based on respect and trust and um, honoring each other's talents and what we need and want. And so mm-hmm. that wasn't exactly welcomed in the corporate world. And so, yes, I, I was, like I was saying, I was, like I was saying, I was only using 5% of who I was. And I felt underused and underpowered and bored out of my mind. Mm-hmm. And how long did you live like that? How long was that your reality? That was for about 13 years. Wow. Okay. So your 20s into your early 30s. Yes. Yeah. And then what happened? So talk about your relationship, your most. Uh, transformational relationship so my most transformational relationship was my marriage mm-hmm. and of course i didn't think of that right that way in my life. <laughs> yeah but what was, what was unique about my marriage was well let me say first what wasn't unique what wasn't unique was i met a man and we fell in love and things were going great in the beginning we thought um we were happy with each other we thought this was it and um there was just so much connection between us. It was so great. Mm-hmm. And we were both in our late twenties or mid to late twenties. And, um, we were having sex. Sex was great in the beginning. It was easy. And then we moved into different stages of commitment. We started spending more time with each other. Then we moved in with each other. Then we got married. And during, during that naturally, natural path that Mm -hmm. really naturally evolved like it does for most couples what happened along the way was that for me sex started to get more difficult so at some point it started to get painful and I went to doctors Mm -hmm. and they checked everything out for me they 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 even checked if I had a lung tumor, which might be like pressing on all the insides in my genitals and causing pain. So everything was checked out and everything checked out fine. Mm -hmm. And no one would explain why in the world would a woman in a long-term relationship with someone she loved was having painful sex. Mm -hmm. And I was getting no answers. I was getting actually wrong answers in the sense of I was getting stuff like, well, it's normal for women to experience pain. And it's normal for women, for example, to also not orgasm. So you were Um, having, okay. okay. And did you see anyone that was like holistic, (laughs) like a a holistic doctor? Okay. So MDs the whole time. Yep. So so the oncologists, yep. Regular doctors. Okay. And top of the line doctors. I was at a top university in California, mm-hmm. top hospital, and the same story. And it was devastating to hear that because, mm-hmm. of course, it's nice to know that nothing was wrong with me m- m- medically. There was right. nothing wrong with my body, but no one was providing any answers. And so I was stuck with, okay, there's nothing wrong medically with me, and there must be something wrong with me as a woman. I can't mm-hmm. orgasm. And mm-hmm. sex hurts, which means I can't have it because it was really it was excruciating. Wow. And so then what ended up happening was I lost my libido. I didn't want to have sex. And parallel to all of this was also the disconnect between me and my husband because mm-hmm. we weren't talking about any of this. Oh, okay. We didn't have the words to, I know I didn't have the words to describe not only the, the physical pain, but like the emotional pain inside, all, mm-hmm. the fears, all the doubts, all the shame that I was feeling. And so 
the loss of connection from having sex was, mm-hmm. was creating a lot of aloneness and distance for us. And then on top of that was this, this inability to really share what was going on. And so we drew apart. Mm-hmm. And that, of course, bred more conflict and more, um, more disconnection. And just it was snowballing to the point where we couldn't connect anymore. There was no relationship anymore. Mm-hmm. And so that ended up in a divorce. It was painful. It was expensive. It was devastating. And I left the divorce believing that it was me. That, again, I wasn't good enough as a woman. I, there must be something wrong with me, with my sexuality. I researched being asexual, and it really matched my experience. Mm. Because also, within a couple of years after the divorce, I lost all desire for anything physical. Like I, you know, I would see a handsome man, and I would think, wow, look, he's sexy. And there would be nothing. There would be no... Mm-hmm no reaction in my body at all. And so I thought, oh, well, there you go. I am asexual. And the definition of asexual is no desire. No desire. Also just no interest in connecting sexually. Um, it, it, there's a spectrum. So some people have no response to sexual okay. stimulus, to having a response, but then taking no interest in pursuing it. Mm-hmm. So there's a spectrum of that. And for me at the time, there was no response, no interest, no nothing. It was just theoretical. Like, yeah, wouldn't it be great? Mm-hmm. But there's no, um, no response to, to that at all in my body. Okay. Did you, in the beginning though, sex was fine before this with previous partners and with him. Can you, do you have any idea what now looking back many years later, now you're an expert. Can you remember what shifted? Was there something externally going on? Was it an internal? Was there some belief? I'm just curious if you can pinpoint that. Absolutely. So now I, I, now that I've also worked with several hundred couples, Mm -hmm. I see the pattern revealing itself over and over. Okay. Predictably. Mm. And what the pattern is, and this very much affects women more than men, although, Mm -hmm. of course, it affects the relationship, so it affects men, but there's something specifically around women in our libido, um, where the shift happens. So if you think about the way a relationship starts in the beginning, is that there is excitement, Mm -hmm. and it's fueled by these hormones that come from newness. Wow, I met someone, and they like me, and... They, f- they think I'm great and uh-huh. they are paying attention to me and there's sexual attraction. So it's this intoxicating cocktail of hormones that is fueling the connection and the energy in the relationship. Uh-huh. And it's actually, it's making us drunk and high. We, it's like, you know, this first couple of months or up to a year, it's like living on fumes. Uh-huh. You don't know where you're getting energy to do work and to go spend like six hours together and still wake up after three hours of sleep and be normal and yeah. keep going with that. Mm-hmm. And again, and that's because of this intoxicating cocktail of hormones. Okay. Eventually, thankfully, that cocktail starts to drop down and goes away because it's not sustainable. Mm-hmm. You can't live on three hours of sleep and right. living on and, um, and that cocktail, by the way, is evolutionarily uh, effective because it gets people to hook up and make babies. Mm. That, Always a, a reason, right? Of course. Nature is very, yeah, everything has a purpose. Okay. It's so very, the point, very effective. Yeah. But again, at some point, those hormones wane. And mm-hmm. then couples find themselves in this place of, oh, where did the energy go? Where did the yeah. passion go? Why are we not so excited about each other? And sex also has to shift along this timeline. In the beginning, during, again, that, that intoxicating period, we're having friction sex. We just want like to be with each other. 
we, 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 the, being body to body is so exciting in and of itself. That's where a lot of the arousal and excitement and passion is coming from. Mm-hmm. want to be with each other. But when that cocktail wanes, you have to find a different source for that passion. Yeah. And most people in general in the whole world, now that I have also different continents to compare, mm-hmm. don't know how to do that. We only, and this is also biological, we only know how to do it when that cocktail of hormones is there. But what happens when that goes away? What do we do? We have to actually cultivate sexual desire in a long-term relationship. And you go through this very crunchy, very uncomfortable period in between these stages Mm -hmm. where you have to face your partner and put down the preconceptions that you have, put down also the, the ideas that you have about yourself of how you should be, Mm. and actually start to get very vulnerable. Mm-hmm. and start to put down your guard and learn to communicate what you need and want and let go of performance because that sex in the beginning stage is what I call friction sex. And it is a lot about performance. You want to show off your best side to your new partner. That's mm-hmm. what it's all about. And friction is the you know body to body. It's like the excitement of, mm-hmm. of that. But at some point also friction sex becomes boring performance is exhausting performance on both both ends for women too Uh, both okay i see what you mean yeah just putting and for women especially Mm. because for women we need variety we need sex that meets us where we are Mm -hmm. not not repeating the same thing it's It's possible for men to do it. It's not exciting, but it's possible they can do it. For women, we can't do it for long periods of time unless there's drugs and alcohol involved. Oh, interesting. So drugs and alcohol kind of facilitate, lubricate the process of performance. And Mm -hmm. but they also mask the vulnerability and they mask Mm -hmm. what's really happening. So it friction sex can be sustained again, under um, drugs and alcohol. However, long-term, it naturally dies out. And again, couples then find themselves in this crunchy, uncomfortable spot of what happened? What do we do? Mm -hmm. And they can either pause and talk about it and start to discover each other vulnerably and also discover themselves throughout this process. Or a lot of couples just fall apart during that time. Well, Mm -hmm. We must not be together. We must not be compatible. We must not be meant to be together. Maybe we should open the relationship Mm -hmm. and the people because see, there's no passion. We're good in other ways with each other, but there's no passion. Yeah. Is it usually after two years? I feel like I've heard that. Yeah. Two years, the cocktail wears off. Yeah. So I, I would say the cocktail wears off even earlier. Okay. But what happens for couples when they fall in love Mm -hmm. is that there's another cocktail that starts to happen, which is the cocktail of validation. Mm -hmm. Wow, this person loves me and I love them. I will do anything for them. And what we do when we say that or think that is we start to put our needs on the back burner. Mm, yeah. And we start to want to please the other person. So it's a switch from performance to actually now giving, 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 and not asking for what you need. So mm. curtailing the, the other direction of getting and receiving. Okay. And giving ourselves up. So we start giving ourselves up for love and the relationship because it's also so intoxicating. Mm-hmm. We all want to be loved. We want to belong. We want to be needed and wanted yeah. by that person. And we start to lose ourselves there. And that's when love comes into the picture. This is what happens. Mm-hmm. Men and women do this. You see, right? The, okay. So both people are, their needs on the back burner. Yeah. So that in a sense, they're not necessarily being truthful. Yeah. To, to each other. Okay. It's fascinating. Okay. And it's 
coming, it's coming from really a really good place inside. Like mm-hmm. I want to be my partner. I want to make them happy. Mm-hmm. And equal, it's coming from fear. If I don't make mm-hmm. them happy, they're yeah. going to leave or they're going to be disappointed with me. Mm-hmm. And men and women do this equally, but it looks very differently. Mm-hmm. Women stop asking for what we need. We stop, for example, asking for more time or slowing down. Mm-hmm. We stop asking for, or not even just asking, but reinforcing this idea that we need time with our partners. That at the end of a busy day, if you've only seen each other for five minutes in the beginning of the day and 15 minutes at the end of the day when you're both exhausted, mm-hmm. that's not enough for a woman to feel connected to her partner and yeah. want to have sex with him. Mm-hmm. Or this is equally true in a same-sex relationship. Mm-hmm. We need time. We need to be held. We need to be touched. We need to be paid attention to. We need to be played with. We need to be listened to. There needs to be interaction. And again, when when couples go deeper into a relationship and they move in with each other and life takes over and have children, the, num- the amount of time that they spend with each other keeps shrinking to the mm-hmm. point where they're, they're just roommates. They're passing each other in the hallway as they're dealing with things. And for yeah. women, that is not enough to feel connected and wanting sex. Mm-hmm. Okay. And this is because, just on a small tangent, because this could be a huge conversation. <laughs> I know. <laughs> So but interesting. Sexual desire is responsive, it means it's responding to certain elements, like I mentioned, mm-hmm. together, attention, being listened to, being touched, being played with. And so, in absence of those things, she has nothing to respond to. She's mm-hmm. responding to work that she's been doing all day, mm-hmm. the children that's been taking up her attention, and all the other million things. Mm-hmm. And that's different for men. Men's sexual desire is spontaneous. They can think of their woman, even though they haven't seen her for days, and be like, oh, I want to have sex with her. And arousal mm-hmm. is ready for them. Whereas for women, arousal follows all those elements that make us feel connected to our mm-hmm. partner. And then at some point, it's like, ooh, I'm starting to feel good. Ooh. I'm starting to want more. Ooh, I want you to kiss me now. Ooh, I want you to play with my breasts. Mm-hmm. Then it's like, oh, I think I'm ready for sex. Okay. So progress or a process, okay. much more of a process. Yeah. A process. Okay. And it's, it, it's dependent on all these things preceding mm-hmm. this type of sex. And so just to tie all of this up, there's so many parts along this process where couples really truly misunderstand what's going on. Like I said, in mm-hmm. the end of that hormonal cocktail in the beginning, they think that they're just incompatible. The passion is gone, but no, it's just that they're entering a new stage. And during that time, again, women will start to see like, Oh, friction sex is not working for me anymore. I want something else, but they're not going to, we don't know how to talk about it. Mm-hmm. So they're, this disconnect and then love might or might not come in. But if it does, there's the, the not understanding that we're folding ourselves into pretzels for each other out of love, but also we end up losing ourselves and become resentful. Mm -hmm. And all of that is causing this distance between partners, which is really not working for women because we start to feel less and less connected and more and more like roommates. Like I, can't respond to you sexually if I'm not connected to you. Yeah. But we think then that that's, there's something wrong with us. And all this misunderstanding just snowballs and snowballs hmm. and creates more and more distance. And that's where couples get stuck over and over. And this is what, what my coaching practice is about. Couples come in and again, I can predict exactly what happened when hmm. pretty much by them describing where they are today. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. all is predictable. So predictable. Us humans, I mean, we think we're so unique, but responding to the, to the chemicals that we have. Chemicals and wire, our biological mm-hmm. wire. Yeah. And we've all lived in a society that 
doesn't talk about sex. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Me in the Netherlands, which is really at the forefront yeah. of the world in sex education. And still there's gaps in people's understanding. And, and so there's so many opportunities to, to misunderstand each other and to misunderstand ourselves and what's happening. And this is why it's so hard for everyone mm-hmm. from the U S to Australia, to Europe, to Africa, to Asia, to everywhere. Mm-hmm. Your, what is your mission right now? And I want to go back to your marriage as well, but just your, you know, you're, you're on a mission now to work with primarily women right on their libido and, and couples. So my mission is to demystify and untangle these misconceptions around female sexuality, Mm -hmm. especially in a long-term relationship. There's been a lot of amazing breakthroughs and, and like breakthroughs in thought and understanding of women's sexuality when it comes to being single and a lot of you know, liberation that has been afforded to women. And then female sexuality in a long-term relationship is still a huge mystery and a taboo. Because mm. once we're in a relationship, it's customary to not talk about it because now it happens behind closed doors. Now that we've committed to each other and we've said, you know, we've said that this is it for us, that the assumption is that everything now should go smoothly and perfectly because again, love is in the picture. And this then of course adds a whole new level of shame for women. Mm. As if, you know, instantly when you go through a wedding or you have a wedding ring, you instantly know how to be a wife. You instantly know what to do when you have children and your body has changed and you don't understand why your body, you know, why your sexuality is shifting too. Mm-hmm. Somehow instantly, because again, you're married or you're in a committed relationship, you're supposed to know. And again, that creates this other layer of shame. And that's what I, that's what my mission is, is to help women and couples and men understand what's happening and help them find each other. Mm-hmm. And realize their dreams of love and connection and, and a future that they really want together in a long term relationship. That's beautiful. Quite a mission. And also, I want to add too, and pass it on to their children. Mm, I, yeah. I melt every time my couples, when they come to me, when they share their why for doing this work mm-hmm. and it's that they want to be an example of a loving, affectionate couple that are in love with each other, not just, you know, affectionate as, as human beings, but as lovers. And they want to model that healthy relationship to their children. Yeah. That their children look back and say, Hey, our parents loved each other. Like, look at that. Mm-hmm. You can tell, like the way my dad looked at my mom or my mom looked at my dad and you can tell that that there was this connection and chemistry between them and i think that's so powerful definitely on and and give this ease and freedom to to the next generations mm-hmm. definitely it all starts there right is the modeling so in your own with your own parents was that something that you did see or didn't see did you have any modeling there no no i did not see that i did Mm -hmm. not see affection or Mm -hmm. uh, them being in love and honestly i didn't see that anywhere except the movies Mm -hmm. okay in the make belief world Mm -hmm. um but there was also one thing that i wanted to mention about kind of how i envisioned my future i know from a very early age i knew that that was possible despite not seeing any evidence in my at home or around or with people around me, but I had always dreamed of being in love and making love mm. as a child. And honestly, I didn't know what that meant. Yeah. You didn't know the details, but. Didn't know the details, but, <laughs> but there was a deep knowing that that's possible and, I, and it felt so real. And I did see some of that in the movies. Mm-hmm. 
And that is why I'll, my own experience with a sexless marriage was so painful because in a way I thought that's possible. That was possible. I, I saw that image inside myself that making love and, and having passionate sex and being in love was possible. But then I wasn't experiencing it. And that gap was incredibly mm-hmm. painful. And curious about your thought process, because the thinking and the shame you were talking about, you know, when it grows, it just gets bigger and bigger. So in that time you're in the marriage, there's not a lot of communication. And then you're, because you're telling your own story, your partner's probably telling his own story. And so the mind body connection is something I, I talk about a lot and have experienced um, you know, where something is going on emotionally and it's manifesting in the body. So was that something that, you know, with the painful sex, do you equate that to the mind body connection? Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And looking back, the mind body connection or the, actually the disconnection started to happen because we started to lose connection between our, each other. Mm -hmm. We couldn't, I, I couldn't articulate that, Hey, I do want to be able to orgasm. Can we explore this together? And that bred resentment. And then my Mm. body reacted to that. My body naturally tightened up because we as human animals cannot be open and closed at the same time. Resentment Mm. closes us up, Mm -hmm. right? It's It's a contraction. And for sex, women need to open up. We need to let our partners in. Muscles need to open up. Uh, our whole body needs to receive a partner. Mm -hmm. And so it was, I I, I didn't know any of this at the time, but it it was all happening perfectly logically where I was getting resentful or I wasn't getting my needs met of of the kind of attention that I needed from him or the kind of touch that I needed from him. Mm -hmm. So I was closing down and I couldn't open up. And then the body was responding with tightness. Mm-hmm. And that created then the fears of what's wrong with me, the shame, there is something wrong with me, more disconnect, which mm-hmm. meant the body was closing more up, which again made it harder to open up and on and on. And it was just yeah. this downward spiral to the point where I stopped wanting to have sex because again, the body was like, well, why want it mm. if you're closed up? And this is a piece that I really want to emphasize that. Mm. In modern medicine and in modern psychology, women losing our libido is seen as a pathology. There's something wrong with us. It's a disorder. The body is not acting the way it's supposed to. And the truth is actually the body is doing exactly what it's supposed to, given what is happening. Again, lack of connection, Hmm. shame, resentment, it will naturally close your body up. And the body will naturally want to protect you from having sex that's only going to get you more resentful and get you more pain. Mm -hmm. more More of what you don't want. And so women losing libido in a long term relationship is a protective pattern. Our bodies are protecting us. Our bodies are saying, you are not getting your needs met. It's saying you need more. And before you get that, we won't open up. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, the body is is incredibly smart. It's brilliant. Mm -hmm. And it's doing exactly what it needs to do. Right. I know for myself in the beginning of my journey, like first, I lost lubrication and then my my body started to get tighter. Penetration was harder. And so when I went to the doctor, they said, well, just use lube. Mm. Always a Band-Aid. It's a Band-Aid. And it actually has us override the messages from the body. Mm -hmm. Like, no, it's tight. Don't do it. Get your needs met first. Mm -hmm. Allow the body to open up and lubricate instead of using the lubricant to push through the closed gates. Right. Yes. Oh, so counterintuitive. But again, looking at the body as just a a machine, something's broken. Exactly. 
put this thing in there to, to help. So it, during that time, so you were late, um, early thirties, right? This is still late twenties, late twenties. And what resources did you have? Was there books that you were reading? I mean, any websites? I, so I was getting referrals from gynecologists to sex therapists. And that was just such a scary prospect because what I associated sex therapists with was I was going to be diagnosed as a freak. Mm. I was going to be diagnosed as, uh, as being sick. And that was the prevalent thought at the time. Is that, mm-hmm. Like I said, like, um, there, you have a disorder. There's something wrong with you. And so I was just, I was completely freaked out by the prospects of going to see a sex therapist. Um, I did talk to regular therapists and they just hadn't absolutely, they couldn't talk about it at all. Wow. And I um, then sought out some books. And I remember I was reading a book um, called For Yourself by Lonnie Barbach or something like that. And um, I haven't revisited the book since, but I do remember that it said, well, just masturbate, just masturbate, and that's going to get your desire back. And I remember reading it and trying masturbating, but still, all of the relational needs were not being met. Mm-hmm. And so it was, it, there was a disconnect, like it was missing so much of what makes sex in a relationship different than just sex, like a one night stand or a casual sex or masturbation. Mm -hmm. And it is trust and safety and connection with a partner and being able to open up with a partner. Mm -hmm. And so that book, I remember added more to my inadequacy and shame because there I was trying to masturbate. And not only was nothing happening, but I felt worse about myself because nothing was happening. And I, Mm -hmm. you know, day over day, I was like, wow, I'm not feeling more desire for my husband. It's it's a vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle. Exactly. Absolutely. And that's again, that's what my clients go through. It's a, it's Mm -hmm. a vicious, vicious cycle. That's so hard to get out of because it's so sticky too. Once you introduce fear and shame and guilt, Mm -hmm. it's so hard to get out of it without help. Without help. Exactly. And what, so you were going to therapists, what was the turning point for you coming to your own healing and then turning that around now to be on a massive mission? Yeah. The big turnaround was actually discovering coaches rather than therapists. Mm -hmm. I found then my experiences with therapists being very negative in the sense that everything was about me being like having a disorder or something wrong with me and, and fixing me. And then I discovered coaches. I went on a women's retreat just for, for two days in Northern California. And I met these coaches who started asking these questions, which the therapist had never asked me. Wild. Questions such as, what do you want? What lights you up? Mm-hmm. What's your vision? Like, how do you want a relationship to go if you really envisioned it the way you want it to be? And honestly, and I'm still like just so amazed of how revolutionary that was Mm. because no one in my whole life had ever asked me, what do you want? Wow. Yeah. And cared about the answer because like, you know, your question about my trajectory for life and education, it was like, what should I do? Mm -hmm. What kind of career should I have? What career would make me better off? There's always populations or where should I live? What city or what place? It's always shoulds or again, what would make sense or be better? Mm -hmm. Ever ask me, what do I want? And so that was, and this wasn't on a sexual level. That was just. Mm -hmm. Just powerful questions. questions. Yeah. And as I started working with these coaches, I left the whole therapy field behind. And I remember a therapist actually yelling at me that I was giving up on myself, that I was sicker than I thought, that he thought I was. Wow. But I saw really 
I, I saw a, a break where the light was shining through, through those questions. And so mm-hmm. I started working with coaches and I started to wake up to my own desires of what do I want? What, what does a meaningful life look like for me? What does a satisfying look like, life look like for me? And about six months into that work, I also started to come alive. Mm. Because between my divorce and this time, there was about five year, a five year gap. Mm-hmm. And during those five years, I had shut down completely. I had shrunk from shame and mm-hmm. shrunk from all those beliefs that I'm broken and, and that I'm not good enough as a woman. And so I became invisible at work, mm-hmm. with men, in, in just general relationships. And after six months of being coached and starting to wake up, I started to become visible to men again. <laughs> Your light was and, back on. <laughs> yeah, the light was back on. But then also was the, the, this realization that I need, to, I need to get some help. I need to mm-hmm. untangle what happened because I wasn't comfortable having relationships and then being sexual. I mean, even kissing for me just felt like, Oh, where's this going to go? Am I going to be able to be sexual? Mm -hmm. So very quickly, I realized I need to deal with this right now and I need help. Because also most of the coaches weren't broaching the sex subject. Oh, okay. So I was going to ask if if they were coaches, just um, life coaches, let's say. Not necessarily sex coaches. Okay. Because this, I mean, coaching is relatively new. I had a coach about 12 years ago and no, I mean, it was like the first time anyone had heard of it. So this is back um, around that time as well. So were you able to find specifically a sex coach? Yes. Yes. I was okay. able to find a sex coach with whom I really resonated. And it was such a powerful experience mm-hmm. because also then she was asking me these questions of what do you want and giving me permission to actually paint a vision of a sex life that I wanted, which was also revolutionary because I, along with pretty much most women, think that sex is dictated by the man in the relationship, Mm. that he initiates, he leads. And and, and that's in a way true because men are so much faster to arousal, like Mm -hmm. a hundred times faster to arousal. They're ready for sex as soon as you say the word mm-hmm. and it, I know for myself, that was also one of the pressures was that I have to be like a man. I have to have the same mm. reaction and the speed. And when I started working with a sex coach, she started to give me permission to honor my pace, to listen to my body, mm-hmm. to understand my needs and, and desires and speak them. And that's when Honestly, like with life coaches, I was growing at a very, you know, impressive clip. Like over six months, I really had overhauled so much of my life, Mm -hmm. Um, like limiting beliefs. And I was, I had asked for a raise and a a promotion at work and I had gotten it. Like there were just things that were happening that I had never were, had never been able to do. Mm -hmm. But then when I started working with a sex coach and we started to, to, talk about these very vulnerable areas that are at the core of who I am, how I see myself as a woman and how I, like what I believe I deserve. Mm-hmm. It's growth just yeah. rocketed. It just took off like, like a rocket ship and it was so amazing. And it was then very quickly into that journey that I was clear, like a hundred percent clear that this is what I want to do. Mm. Our sexuality as women is not a nice to have, and it's not just for reproductory purposes. Mm-hmm. It's part of our. It's part of our power. It it's like an engine that gives us a boost. And so, at that time, I had been living on maybe one out of three engines because it was like the you know, I had discovered coaching and I was really excited about it. And that gave me purpose, but there was the sexuality engine. And then there was the relationship engine. And then they were connected because for me, I couldn't have a relationship if I wasn't available for Mm -hmm. sex. So those parts went 
together. And so I was just running on one engine. And when those two, those two other engines went online, mm. wow, I was blown away by how I, how confident I started to feel, how good I started to feel in my body, how clear I started to be, how courageous I started to be. And that was the moment where I, again, where I knew like, this is what I wanted to do. And at that time it was limited to working with women. Mm -hmm. And that was very early on in, in, you know, my experience, but it was just very clear sex, sexuality, relationships, and women's power are intertwined. Mm -hmm. And what I say today is that a well-fucked woman will change the world because it's the power that we have that comes from receiving pleasure, being satisfied and expressing ourselves in that realm, Mm -hmm. in in the passionate realm, in the vulnerable realm of sex and sexuality. Once that engine is on, we are unstoppable. Mm -hmm. And I saw that in my own life and I see that with all my clients and that's, that's what gets me going every day. Every day. Wow. That's incredible. I love that. I got to write that down. Well, (laughs) fucked woman (laughs) will change the world. And and, okay. So that was your aha moment. And then you went on a journey to then. I mean, study for many years, I'm assuming. Yep. So <laughs> and being a research subject. Oh, okay. Yes. yes. And doing all your, um, did you, so you have, talk a little bit about your education and what the process, like, you know, what that looked like. And that was probably a lot of discovery in that as well. Like what, what's available out there and what did you res- resonate with? Yeah. Um, so my path started with learning this practice called orgasmic meditation. Mm. Which is, um, med- it's a it's a sexual meditation practice that brings together mindfulness and awareness of the body mm-hmm. while being touched sexually, and that was incredibly liberating for me because mm-hmm. it it helped me come into my body and learn about it. And so I practiced that for several years and was involved with the the people who created the practice and was was studying with them. But that was just one small element that that was kind of where where I started. But it got me then interested in also understanding the whole psychosomatic connection, the body mind connection. Mm. And that led me to study also trauma. So I studied somatic experiencing, which is called, which is SE for short. It's Mm -hmm. a modality that was created by Peter Levine. And it's a trauma resolution modality that works with the nervous system, which Mm -hmm. is incredibly important for sexuality. So this started then to add this level of understanding of what do our bodies primarily as women, but for men as well, Mm -hmm. in terms of safety for the nervous system to relax so that it can get aroused. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this added again, a a whole level of richness to understanding of sexuality and what we need to, for, for sexuality to go online fully, to be able to express sexuality, but in a safe place. Mm -hmm. And then I also started to, uh, work with couples. And so then I trained with John and Julie Gottman and, um, I studied Sue Johnson's work, um, in emotionally focused therapy and started to add the emotional focus and the richness that comes from understanding that, mm-hmm. um, and how to help couples and, and women as well, but primarily this is a couple's, um, challenge. um, And that's to connect emotionally during the challenging times when there is disconnection, when there is conflict. Mm -hmm. And so it just started to all add a lot of richness. And I began to create my own approach, the trauma piece, the sexuality piece, the couples therapy piece, the emotions piece, and bringing it all together. And Mm -hmm. so I have a unique approach and I have a very structured approach that I take couples through as well as women. It's different tracks. I work with single women individually and I only work with married or women in a relationship in a couple. 
Okay. So committed, and, committed yeah. couples only. Couples only. Exactly. Okay. Um, if, if a woman wants to work with me and she's in a relationship, but her partner doesn't want to work with me, I'm unable to do personal work with them. Mm. However, I have online options that like, for example, that she can do on her own. Okay. And that's, and that's, that was a, a deliberate choice because sex in a, in a relationship is a relational issue. It has to be worked out relationally because the causes of the issues are relational. Interesting. Okay. So I will only get in person work with them as a couple. Mm -hmm. And of course, single women are wanting to prepare themselves for the next relationship or heal something from the past. And so of course that can be done without the relationship itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about um, people in a, in an open relationship? Would you take them on as clients? I don't work with people in an open relationship. That's not my specialty. And it's uh, frankly, just not my interest as well. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in just for myself and again, my, my own um, interest is, is seeing like what happens in a long-term relationship and how do we work with the, the constraints of the committed relationship and all the things that are changing inside. So how do you invent and reinvent a relationship? How do you make it work given that, like given all of those constraints? Mm -hmm. yeah. so that's my, my specialty. Yes. And how long do you work with people on average? Like a couple comes in, is there a set time that they would commit to working with you? Yes. So I work with couples for a minimum of a year. Wow. So okay. Make a commitment to work with me for a year and I mm -hmm. take them for a journey. A process. Yeah. Uh, and we start with them determining where is it that they want to go? What is mm -hmm. that? What is it that they want? Right. Yeah. And I take them there. Mm -hmm. um, a, a year, it's a very fluid process. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But at the end of that year, they get to where they want to go. Mm -hmm. Year plus or minus. Um, but it's, it's a journey. It's a process. And I don't do session by session mm -hmm. kind of things. Um, because I, it, it, in, in my experience, it doesn't support them through the regular ups and downs that people go through in a relationship. Right. And this is a pattern that, for example, I see with everyone, they, they buy an online course or they get a book and they get very excited about it and they do the first two chapters or the first two sessions and they have two date nights. And then the third one is hard to, to, to plan. The fourth one is even harder Then they give up on the fifth one. And so there's just that natural rise and peak and fall. And then they are again thinking like, see, we failed. We mm -hmm. tried another book and it didn't work and um, they get discouraged. And so that's what the year piece comes in is it is going to take a year and you're going to have lots of these dips. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to teach you how to get through dips without giving up and without distancing yourself from each other. Mm -hmm. And that's what you need a whole year. Yeah. Makes sense. I mean, it's, it is that momentum is like in the beginning you have that and then you're right. It's just, it's that commitment to riding the roller coaster ride. And it is a roller coaster ride. <sighs> Definitely. Sure. It is. Do you, do you believe, I mean, this is because you work with a lot of single women, right? So do you believe that being in a relationship is ultimately the best place to heal and to grow? Or do you feel that women need to really do all this work on their own before getting into a relationship? It's both. Yeah. It's absolutely both. And it's, it's really two parallel tracks. Mm -hmm. We need to do our work individually, but then practice manifesting that, well, not manifesting, but uh, practice that work in a sense of like, Okay, like if I'm learning how to ask for what I want, I do need to do some inner work. Mm -hmm. But the the act of asking for what you want can only happen when you are in relationship with another human being. Right. <laughs> yeah. Whether it's a committed relationship or not, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Literally, like in relationship with another human being. Mm -hmm. And so the healing partly comes from giving yourself permission to figure out what you want and then to ask for it, to, to voice it. Mm -hmm. And then the healing comes from 
by the person receiving it and actually meeting you or learning to be okay with the rejection. And if they don't meet you to then also come back to yourself and learn to be with that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a process that involves both. It's a process that requires both because of these challenges are again the, the 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 wounds are relational mm-hmm. shame is a relational wound it doesn't come out of thin air we're not born with it it comes mm-hmm. from right relating to someone who thought negatively about us and may have shamed us and then mm-hmm. we take on the shame and then the healing comes from both Mm-hmm. as well. Okay. And, you know, when I work with women individually, we do a lot of inner work, but then again, they get to practice that in their relationships, their relationships in their families, their work relationships, of course, dating or their romantic relationship, mm-hmm. but even in the absence of dating and their um, romantic relationships, they get to heal that with other people in their lives. Mm-hmm. Because it spills out, right? It's all connected. Again, how we relate to other people. So I just want to know, so your biggest pain has become your greatest gift. Absolutely. Right. So what would you tell other people, let's say maybe not in a necessarily similar situation, but how did you take, you know, this incredibly painful experience that you went through with marriage and then divorce and then turn it around? The biggest thing I would say is get help. Mm -hmm. That that was the, honestly, that was the second biggest gift. The pain was, Mm -hmm. I was the motivator and it got me to, to do something, but that something was getting help. And like I mentioned earlier, these patterns, these downward spirals are so sticky. Mm -hmm. They are so much get, that gets tangled up. Our the shame and hurt feelings and resentment and attachment wounds from childhood and trauma doesn't necessarily have to be some kind of huge trauma like abuse or rape, but the trauma of being human. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Little t traumas mm-hmm. that affect how we show up. And so it all gets tangled up. And we can't, we stop being able to see our own goodness, our own wholeness. Mm. And that's where, um, that's where the transformation happened for me, that there was this pain and I got help and mm-hmm. I still, you know, I'm a huge proponent of getting coached, of mm-hmm. going to therapy. Now I'm a lot better at finding therapists who are amazing yeah. um, and mm-hmm. are, uh, really focused also on wholeness and wellness mm-hmm. and helping ha- having someone help you see the wholeness in you and the vision and the yeah. dreams and help realize that. Because again, I wouldn't be here if that part was missing. Mm-hmm. I would not figure this out because I was caught in the same thoughts that mm-hmm. were dragging me down. Right. Probably I couldn't see outside of them. So yeah, so g- the pain and then getting help are huge elements of transformation. Mm-hmm. And what's and next for you? You're not alone. Yes, you're not alone. Exactly. And just even putting, I mean, this content out there and you, I mean, you have courses and you're speaking and writing articles in many magazines. So quickly, can you touch on that? And I'm going to, I'll put all your, um, where people can find you. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so I've been published in the Huffington Post and I'm regularly quoted in magazines such as uh, Elite Daily and Bustle and Refinery29. Um, so you can see me as a sexpert. A sex a sexpert. Expert. I love that. <laughs> yes. And yeah. I write also a lot on my blog, which is at irenefair.com. Mm-hmm. And also on the website, I have a free mini course, which is which has gotten amazing feedback from everyone. Pretty much like everyone writes to me um, about it. And it's called How to Want Sex Again. And it's for women who have gone through similar situations that I mentioned that I went through in my mm-hmm. marriage, in their libido, dealing with painful sex. And I demystify three 
things that are in a way taken completely for granted. Like this is how things are in a relationship that are huge myths and that are incredibly dangerous because they cause women to go down the paths that I described. Mm-hmm. Thinking there's something wrong with us. We're broken. We're not sexual enough. And which frankly destroy relationships. Yeah. And so I demystify those conceptions. And then I talk about the truth about female libido and offer a five-step blueprint on how to reconnect to your own body. And not only that, but to have pleasurable sex that has you wanting sex more and more Mm -hmm. in a natural way, in a way that honors your body. Mm -hmm. So that's also on the website. That's okay. available for, for anyone who, w- with an email address, you can get that right away. Awesome. I love your website. Your blog is really, really excellent. So many amazing articles and your wealth of knowledge. So and I you. appreciate your sharing your story and being vulnerable. And yes, yeah. thank you. And what's next for you? I know you're, you're living abroad, so we didn't touch on that, but you're living in the Netherlands. You just moved earlier this year. Uh, 10 months or, ago or 10 months ago yeah you know, time is flying by Crazy. and so what this new new country new adventure is yeah. give us a snapshot of what's next for you well what's next is really rooting myself here and one of my dreams has been for a while opening a retreat center mm, and yeah. I want to be able to have a retreat center where I also work with horses. It's also one of my interests is mm, bringing okay. the trauma work and the relationship work and couples to horses and helping mm. them build trust and connect through horses, which is just a modality that I absolutely fascinated by. So interesting. Yeah. You have this like 1100 pound animal who can, <laughs> Transform your relationship very quickly. Um, so, yeah. So what's next is working towards creating that mm-hmm. and, and opening a retreat center and bringing couples for deep and indiv- well individual work for them as a mm-hmm. couple, but doing that on site and in person. Of course, Corona has made this quite difficult. Yeah. You know where this is going to go, but that's the big dream for me. The big dream right now. Yeah, is doing more more in-depth personal work with couples and offering um, these retreats where they can go Mm -hmm. deeply into this work. And in a shorter period of time, of course, there's still a year long path, but then also just doing the intensive and and introducing them to things in person. Right. Important important to me. Yeah. I was going to say you're on. Say it one more time. Sorry, the Wi-Fi. And making it uh, available to the rest of Europe is also really important. It's exciting to be here. Yes. I mean, you, I know living in Europe as well, people do not know about coaches. They're like, that's so American. Um, So I think, you know, you're definitely on the forefront, I would assume, right? So, I mean, you're all, you know, in the most liberated country sexually. <laughs> the Netherlands is actually here. There's quite a few coaches. Oh, the Netherlands okay. is at the forefront. So it is yep. a very popular, popular field. Um, oh, all okay. the uh, wellness centers have wellness coaches. Mm-hmm. Career, uh, if you work in a corporate setting, they have career coaches, but I think oh, the Netherlands okay. is very unique around this. Mm-hmm. Very, very revolutionary. That's really cool. So you're in the right spot. I'm in the right spot. It feels good. That's great. Yes, it actually, it, it, on so many, so, so many levels, it's, mm. it's a perfect place for me. I don't know what had me like exactly say, like, this is where I want to be, but whatever it was, I'm incredibly grateful. That's okay. So you just, it was more of a gut feeling. It was very much a gut feeling. Like mm. it was clarity, but it wasn't like, oh, it, 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 the clarity wasn't born out of rational calculations and thinking mm-hmm. where am I better off? It was just this clarity. Like I need to be in the Netherlands. So. Wow. And, and then, uh, as you've been there now, 10 months, it just is like more solidified. Absolutely. More and like, more. This is where I need to be. That's so cool. Again, inspiring, inspiring people to follow the gut. And then, mm-hmm. you know, as you learn to listen to that more, it generally isn't wrong. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Or, 
it might not be exactly right, but it will lead you to the next right step. And then the mm-hmm. next right step that's going to lead you to where you need to be. Mm-hmm. So not everything is always instantaneous. Right. In terms of like no. land on the right <laughs> thing. But yes, yeah. my experience, as long as you follow your gut feeling, it'll lead you in the right direction. It'll lead you to the resources you need to get mm-hmm. to where you need to go or the people or the uh, like awareness of something new that you didn't know existed. That's mm-hmm. like, lead you to the right place. So listen to your intuition. Listen to your intuition. Would you have to and ask get... yourself, what do you want? Yes, exactly. It's a question that is so fundamental, but is so overlooked, like you said. So I'm so glad you t- you talked about that because it's, it's really, I and mean, that's why I love coaching as well. It's it, the answers are inside. We're just not being asked those questions a lot of the time. Exactly. So, awesome. Thank you so much, Irene. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. This was my, it was my pleasure to share my story and to have this conversation. I'm very Thank deep you. conversation. That brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoy the show, please rate and review on Apple podcasts. It makes a big difference for visibility and even better share this episode with a friend and don't forget to subscribe. So you never miss an episode every other Wednesday. If you're interested in working together to elevate your online presence, I'd love to hear from you. Reach out to me on Instagram at whereiswillow. I also hang out on LinkedIn, Willow McDonough. Until then, cheers to carving your own fucking path. I love you.